you don't know about pricing. You don't know. Uh, that, that is one of the limitations of real estate. You have certain indications about what's going on in the markets, but you don't know how much your assets are worth. Sandor Valner, thank you so much for joining me on 20 Minute Leaders. Thank you. Glad to be here, Mike. So good to have you. Uh, so we know each other through the J Ventures uh, Fund. You actually you just told me you're you're considered now a rabbi as a, for the J Ventures opening up the LA chapter, which is wonderful, and I get to work with your wonderful son as an associate at the firm. And uh, you know, Sandor, I'd love to spend these 20 minutes getting to know two things that really I know nothing about. Uh, investment banking and uh, Latin America. You're from Mexico. You actually, though, you got to study in Mexico Tel in Weizmann Institute and uh, at Stanford University, uh, both AI and business. And then you go to investment banking. So you're going to have to give me a little bit of a rundown how that all uh, happened. I'm going to let you go from now on. Sandor, talk to me a little bit about y your background and where you came from. Sure. Uh, born and raised in Mexico, uh, Lithuanian uh, people who escaped the war coming to the United States, couldn't get into the United States, stopped in Mexico, liked that there and stayed there. Was uh, We were raised in Mexico and then uh, you know, started schooling um, initially in Mexico, then went to the Mahon Weizmann for a year. Where, then, where in Mexico did you live? Mexico City. I was just Mexico. there for a week with my good friend from Stanford, Santiago. Beautiful place. It's a, it's a great city. Highly recommended. Great food, great people. Great very people. Israeli, right? I, I found the people there to be very similar to Israelis in Tel Aviv. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, fun, it's a fun city. Uh, yeah. I, highly recommended. Once we get into normalcy again, uh, highly recommended. Definitely. So, uh, you know, then went to school uh, uh, in Mexico, studied engineering, then went to Stanford and studied uh, both business and artificial intelligence before artificial intelligence was what we now know artificial intelligence is, uh, but uh, at least to say it was very interesting and then I um, started a career of 15 years in investment banking doing mostly international mergers and acquisitions and then uh, shifted my career into uh, private equity real estate um, and managed uh, uh, large private equity real estate funds uh, also mostly internationally and um, sold uh, uh, my interest in the, in the real estate company last year. And I've since been uh, doing angel investing, mostly in PropTech and FinTech. And uh, now I'm starting um, a new uh, tech-enabled uh, investment banking path. Amazing. Okay, so Sandor, uh, I'd love to talk about this intersection of, you know, you're in real estate for a long time. You're an expert in real estate. Now, just from my understanding, when you did that, that was traditional real estate, right? Not necessarily, you know, techie, AI powered investment, uh, real estate investing, right? Yeah, this was traditional real estate. We did mostly industrial facilities and we did uh, low income housing and we did offices and shopping centers. Nothing related to tech. How, how, how big are we talking here? Is this like one or two buildings or is this like, you know, 50, 60 buildings? Uh, well, it's more, well, we raised uh, close to $2 billion and, and, and we, uh, we ended up, I don't know how many properties, but probably a couple of hundred. Wow. So, you, so, so managing $2 billion in real estate, is that, is that, is that right? Uh, yes, I, we've managed public and private uh, funds. Uh, wow. Uh, most of it, this was part of a large organization and we did, you know, what I, what I was responsible, you know, the, the funds, the $2 billion that I managed were in, in Latin America. So it was uh, an interesting ride because, you know, this crisis that we're living right now, um, I think is my eighth crisis uh, in terms of financial crisis. So, uh, uh, these countries, uh, particularly Mexico, uh, was having a crisis every six years. So unfortunately, you know, I've learned to live through a lot of them. And I can only say to your audience uh, that 
we're probably going to have more of them, unfortunately. So, Sandor, what have you learned after eight crises? <laughs> well, I've learned that most of the fortunes uh, on the economic side are made in the crises. Uh, don't waste it. My, my GSB professor last quarter told me, Michael, don't waste a good crisis. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the other thing is that I think, my, you know, the biggest learning experiences are during the crises. They're just very intense periods where you are forced to really go uh, back to basics. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of learning and in terms of eventually making money, even though it seems uh, extremely hard at the time um, or, or, or carving a successful career, obviously it's not only about money they're, they're just very good opportunities although what when you're in the middle of the storm it, they're no fun right no no definitely okay so now you know going back to this uh, idea you you're managing two billion dollars in in you know real estate assets and now you're investing in in startups that are you know doing prop tech so what what is property technology and what specifically about it makes you excited you know with your expertise looking at real estate as a whole well, I think what happened when I when I left private equity real estate um, during my years uh, investing in real estate, I, I just found that it's a industry that is very opaque, uh, very inefficient, um, and there there are many many dimensions which of real estate which I think can be improved with with technology and given. Well, what are some of them? Bad, what are some of the really like opaque parts of it? Well, but, but pricing, right? Uh, you know, when you uh, when you lease uh, a, a space, office space, you don't really know what everything else is leasing for. Uh, you don't really you, you don't really know what the terms of the lease uh, are for competitors. Uh, you don't know uh, uh, you know who's doing what, as you do, for example, in the stock market, where there's a very liquid and transparent uh, market. And I think at the end of the day, uh, the lack of liquidity and transparency and all this friction ends up costing everybody. Uh, right. So I think we would all be better off if, if we had a more fluid um, um, system. Okay, so, so, so we're talking about pricing, this idea that you're able to leverage uh, deep technology to really understand markets and understand how to price better. Are there other aspects of real estate that the technology can really go into? Many, for example, I'm an investor in a company that is looking to um, disrupt the construction management industry. And the construction management, you've got architects, engineers, the owners, the bankers, the, uh, the accountants, the contractors, everyone interacting and they don't interact in a single platform so everybody speaks different languages uh, decisions take forever there are a lot of inefficiencies uh, we're trying to build a company that will uh, it's a collaboration tool that where everybody can share information real time and uh, uh, increase efficiencies in, in, in construction. Right, actually, two, this year, two friends of mine from the GSB were working on a product where they, they, they came with the hypothesis that they can look at email conversations between you know, contractors, architects, and builders and find the, and, and predict how much the project is going to be delayed so that they can warn in advance uh, because usually a delay means more money, right? I haven't done construction myself, but from my understanding, a delay means money. And so if you can predict ahead of time that, that there's poor communication and therefore a delay is going to come about, you can actually save quite a bit of, of money. And I think more importantly, you're going to save quite a bit of headache for all parties. Please, please ask your friends to give me a call because we're trying to build really a, a, a platform to do exactly that, to predict delays, uh, avoid delays, uh, and and uh, cost overruns. I'm going to because I actually believe that the one of the founders she has a she did her PhD on this and she actually already had it, something working. So uh, something positive already came out of this talk. But but Sandor, back to you. Uh, you're you're dealing with you're dealing with this. You're also part of J Ventures. What why go into real estate in the first place? What got you excited about real estate and and why real estate in Mexico? Uh, whether the you know the U.S. Europe Israel why Mexico? Well, why Mexico? Because I happen to be born there, and and uh, 
well, my family had historically been in, in, in real estate and I had kind of been bred in, in, in real estate. And it's, uh, it's, a, nice, uh, it's a nice business and a uh, stable business. And it also offers uh, the possibility of uh, creating a lot of jobs and improving the, you know, the standard of living of wherever you're, 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 you're acting. And again, I, you know, I thought that it was an industry that is fairly inefficient and were, were there inefficiencies there are opportunities to have fun to innovate to make money etc right okay and now you now you you have your own startup uh, talk to me a little bit about this one yes we created a, a company called network uh, bankers it's a tech enabled um, uh, investment bank we we've um, put together uh, we now have a network of over 30,000 uh, CEOs around the world that are part of our network and we're uh, providing investment banking and investment management services uh, to that uh, group of 30,000 CEOs. So, so what does that mean investment banking services? So basically investment banking, what I mean by investment banking services in this context is uh, helping these CEOs uh, advising them on raising capital, raising debt, or uh, helping them buy or sell companies. Okay, okay. So these are not CEOs necessarily of early stage startups that are you know just raising a few hundred thousand dollars. I'm guessing these are you know later on in their life cycle. They are. I mean, there's certainly there's some um, startup CEOs where we can raise uh, help them raise uh, venture capital money, but most of most of these CEOs uh, manage um, small or middle-sized uh, companies, and, um, and there are some of them that manage $100 million companies plus, but most of them are smaller. And uh, we will help them um, you know, reach their goals by helping them buy other companies out or selling divisions or raising capital where their financial engineers uh, uh, helping them accomplish their goals. Sure. And I have to know, what are some of the biggest challenges of uh, you know, managing hundreds of assets in real estate? How often do you, do you know, you know their values? Because the values are fluctuating, you know, especially you know, as, as, you know, in the recent years with the crisis all the way from 2008 up to now. How do you even get a good grasp of your holdings? In, in my mind, I'm imagining you know, a team of 100 analysts sitting all day and just doing calculations. Is that the case or are there different approaches to this? Well, I mean, you asked several questions. Uh, one of the questions you asked uh, is about pricing. You don't know about pricing. You don't know. Uh, that, that is one of the limitations of real estate. You have certain indications about what's going on in the markets, but you don't know how much your assets are worth. You can't just uh, look at at what the guy next to you sold for? Is that not good could, enough? You could, but, but there are just, you know, the transactions are few and far between. It's not like the stock market where you have millions of shares that are trading every day. So. They're, they're, the, the transactions are limited, but in, in real estate, the, 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 the one thing you do have is that they tend to be uh, large and, and discrete uh, assets. So you can have a team of two or three people that are monitoring, you know, the management of a, an office building or, or a shopping center. And, 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 and their, their real estate has, typically you have a team in the real estate fund, you have a team that does, for example, acquisitions. Uh, basically you evaluate new investments and then you have another team that does asset management, which really means that you have a team that is monitoring your existing investments. They're making sure that the offices are well managed, that the, 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 the leased, that the, they have adequate, uh, uh, debt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you have uh, an external team that even though these funds tend to be rather small funds, we you tend to um, outsource a lot of this asset management. So you end up uh, having hundreds of people, as you say, monitoring all of these assets, not directly employed by the funds, but indirectly through uh, asset management companies. Right, right. The, the, you know, studying AI in the engineering school of Stanford and of course the business school, did that bring a different paradigm to your thinking behind running the business or how to leverage 
uh, different technologies to help you. How, how, do you? how do you see that education or that part of yourself and your background play into the role of, this, of, of these great investment banking endeavors? Well, I, I, I think the, the computer science um, background helped me uh, organize my thoughts and helped me uh, look into things as to how they can be scaled um, and, and, uh, and automated. Uh, so I think in the back of my mind, uh, I always had that whenever kind of a big or difficult problem came about. Uh, AI didn't really play much of a role because when I studied AI in, um, in 1985 or so, um, you didn't have the algorithms that you have right now, the learning algorithms just didn't exist. So it was actually fairly frustrated that we were a little bit ahead of our times in terms of technology, couldn't do much with it. We didn't have the computer power. We didn't, uh, we didn't really have the, the knowledge of the required algorithms. Um, so to right. me, it was actually uh, enlightening. It was really exciting once I left real estate, uh, discover these new things that have been developed in artificial intelligence that now I can, I have a new toy that I can play with, right? I mean, this is this is a fascinating technology. Of, Incredible. So, you know, we're, I'm, I'm really, I feel like a young kid with a new toy uh, trying to, you know, explore something something different. And, and, and going back to the beginning of the conversation, trying to piece all of the different parts of my career into something that makes sense, which probably never will make sense. But, you know, it, you, it's, it's, it's an interesting jigsaw puzzle that, that you assemble throughout your career. But it's been a lot of fun. No, definitely. I, you know, I, I go into a, our our computer vision course website, uh, the notorious CS two thirty one N. It's the master's. Uh, it's the you know graduate school class for for convolu convolutional neural networks for computer vision. And the first thing that you see on the website is a neural network that is able to take an image and classify it. And it's running on the browser. And I can just imagine, you know, to me coming in as a new student and seeing this fresh and having all the tools at my disposal with a few lines of code and my own personal computer, whether it's amazing or whether it's it's crappy I can still run all those um, algorithms even you know on my phone I'm sure it's a very different learning experience than in 1982 or 1984 and, and learning about these algorithms Sandra I, I'm very curious you know looking from uh, up from very high to now going down buying real estate uh, also especially for young individuals all the time I hear in the news about you know the American dream to own a house to own an apartment Israel also uh, people my age are constantly thinking about, okay, when am I finally going, going to be able to make my first real estate investment? What is your take on this? Is this a rational thing to do as a young person uh, to, to go and, and, and run after a real estate investment? Is it better to, in your mind to, you know, to put it somewhere, uh, to put it somewhere else? Or is it, is it just like a sexy fad or is there a real meaning behind it? Well, I think you have to go back to basics. Uh, you know, real estate has been a relatively stable asset. It doesn't mean that it's not has its risks, but as long as you don't have a lot of leverage of debt on it, uh, it's a fairly stable asset. Um, but going back to basics, I mean, one of the things that these crises uh, teach you is that you should save. Right, you really should save for a rainy day because you don't really know when we're going to be quarantined or when there's going to be a slowdown or when you're going to lose your job, etc. Second thing you you learn is that you really need to diversify your assets. So if you're going to be invested in real estate, that's great, but you know I don't think anyone should have you know 99% of their assets in real estate, right. Right? even though I love real estate. Right? I mean. You should diversify. Why? Because, you know, you shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket. You should have it in a few baskets because things happen. Right. Right. But all in all, uh, real estate, uh, one, as an investment is stable. It certainly plays a role. But more importantly, it's it's uh, it's your house. Right. So, you know, you, you use it and you should you should uh, you should enjoy it. And uh Fortunately, in, in this country, which, by the way, is not the case in most countries in the world, uh, uh, the, the, the loan rates, the interest rates are so low that a lot of people can afford 
buying houses, even if they're small at the beginning. This is not the case in many in many countries. Right. Uh, unfortunately, these crises make uh, houses less affordable, so it's you know it's tougher. But you know uh, this is a tough time, but we're going to have better times as well. So be be patient. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Sandor, I want to thank you again for, for this time and, and for all the great insights. Before we leave, I have to put you on the spot and ask you my favorite question, which is three words that you would use to describe yourself or that your GSB classmates would use to describe you or your partners. Three words to describe. Well, um, it's a good life. It's a good life. Well, it's four. It's <laughs> Enjoy. a good Enjoy, learn, enjoy, learn. learn make, it's a good make, life. Make, learn, make good friends at Stanford. Start companies, take risks. Um, that was worth much more than three words. Trust me. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandor. Thank you. Take care. Say hi to your son for me, and uh, and stay safe and stay healthy. Will do. Thanks again. Take, take care. care. Bye bye.